All right, all right. New viewers, welcome. Welcome to the minute. show. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. Long time viewers. We love you guys. Ken Havens, Richard Pyers, Warren Puffett, Brandon Scott. Warren Puffett. Rachel Fintwit is here. Not the same when she's not. We love that she's here. Uh, Roger Weatherford, Sacramento, I see you. All right, listen up. Listen Do you want to explain, uh, want to explain why we've been absent? Uh, yes. So last week's show got canceled because Michael's oh, little boy. Hang on. Back up. We missed two weeks ago, too. Hi, Holy oh, Days. It was, uh, it was your own. Right. Oh, uh, we missed one episode because Michael and I are two of these um, uh, Jewish media controllers you've been hearing so much about. And uh, <laughs> it was the High Holidays. We missed last week because little Kobe Batnick broke his leg. But he is going to be good as new. So, uh, but but for for uh, for a minute there it was like, how could we do a show? So I I feel like we made the right decision. I don't think yeah. you would have been in your right mind. Yeah, we're back. So, but we're back. Now, way to way to uh, way to bring us down though at the beginning. That was great. I'm trying to, let's build this back up. All right, let me build this back up. I want to announce friend of the show, JC Peretz. You guys love him if you watch the compound content is in the hospital right now expecting twin oh, oh, God, baby boys. No, no, no great okay, news. Yeah, yeah, okay. So he's got two little boys on the way today, I am told. And uh, all is proceeding according to plan. So that's going to be that's going to be exciting. Uh, JC's got a, a little girl already. So now he's going to have he's going to have a family of five. Very exciting times. Um, I also want to say thank you to all you guys for making the last couple of shows we've done just monstrous. Uh, shows. Thank you so much for watching the, and sharing the Bob Pisani episode, the one we do, did before that with Rubenstein. Like we, uh, we, we really hit some momentum here, and we know it's all because of you. Uh, you know, so, it was also it was a kind of the Scanlon episode. Somebody, one of our colleagues, uh, slacked me. Hey, there's this really great uh, uh, Substack blogger that you should have on. Her name is Kyla Scanlon. I said she's coming on on Thursday. Yeah, well, Kyla killed it, and uh, both both Pisani and Kyla will be back. So thank you guys for blowing that show up. Huge download numbers, huge traffic on uh, on YouTube channel, and we really appreciate it. Okay, we have a sponsor tonight. Michael, who's sponsoring the show? Listen, all right, it's been a rough year. Uh, and what? <laughs> what? Okay. It's been a rough year for the stock market. For the oh, market. yes, it for really has. Assets. It's been a rough year for risk assets. And listen, you might not believe these marks, but guess what? It makes me feel better. J Big John, throw it up. See all that green? Oh, uh, what's that? Uh, I got a 23% mark of my Basquiat. My Warhol's up 2.5%. Listen, Wait, makes me feel better. You're, you're making money this year in art? Well, I haven't, I haven't sold them. Oh. But Why don't you tell me about any of these paintings? Are they all, they're, they're all paintings? I mean, why don't I tell you? Get yeah. your own why research. You? These are my paintings. Get your own. Uh, all right, good for you, man. Look at you. No big Look deal. at you. And when we're, so, all right, so you're doing this on the Masterworks platform. You're not buying every painting they put up. You're choosing. What are you basing this? Give, given your extensive knowledge of the art world, what are you making these decisions based on? I would say it's more art than science. <laughs> ah, <laughs> look at you. So you're not a quant in, in the art world. You're, you're more going by feel? I go with feel, you know? Okay. All right. Is there, Name do we brand. have it? All right, I'm trying to advance this thing. Do we have a, a specific Warhol? landing URL for Masterworks? Let's advance this thing. What do you? What do you? What do you do? We have so much to do tonight. I, uh, is there a specific landing page we want to send people to for Masterworks? They know where to go. Listen, I've got to get out of here at 16. I've got to fight the cash. Let's go. Okay. Okay. I have an Islanders game. Uh, all right. So thank you for our sponsor. Uh, earnings season. It's it's begun. How do you feel so far? Terrible. Why? So far, so good. Well, no. Netflix is up 14 percent of the after hours. Um, yeah. Oh, you fucking sold it. You did, right? What price did you sell it at? Did you get stopped out? At the lows. No, you didn't. On the lows. But and you, you never bought it. You know, look at this Listen guy. Listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to come and say hi. I watched as Netflix's earnings were reported. I watched the life drain out of Michael's soul because <laughs> he said yesterday that he got stopped out at the bottom and his stock was up like 8% yesterday. And he's like, all day he kept saying, I, hi everyone, by the way, it's Ben, nice to see everyone. He kept saying, <laughs> if Netflix goes up after hours, I'm going to kill myself. Because oh, I, I didn't say that. Well, <laughs> okay. Well, I still feel like you need to honor it. So, okay. <laughs> well, listen, 
Netflix was looking good. It was showing relative outperformance of all the fangs. I had my stop in. I was willing to risk 10% to make 40. I thought that was reasonable. But listen, a growth stock that's down 70%, even though I'm like bullish on Netflix long term, I'm not I'm not trying to get married. I was in it for a trade. I had a stop in too, but I had a right? stop. I had a stop at the June lows, which were way lower. Oh, okay. Because I'm smarter you. than you. Good no, I don't know. I no, I don't know how I chose no, that stop you know level, what? to I be respect, honest. I have too much respect for risk. So what was the day with that really nasty red candle? I don't know if it was Thursday or whatever, yeah, Tuesday, yeah. whatever day somebody it was. Da somebody downgraded it. Okay. But like Barclays or somebody was like strong neutral. And so my, stock, st got my stock got hit. It's not like I was like, it's not like I logged on and sold it. I'm I had a the sell side analyst. I was praying that Netflix would jump after. I hours. had a stop in. So uh, anyway, yeah, uh, it's up 20% from where I sold. Maybe I actually days. think, so I actually think, um, I actually think this is very good news for the market, to be honest with you. And the reason being is Netflix is one of the early reporters in the communication services sector, and it gets hammered every time. And what happens is that sets the tone for, for the Disney's and you know all the other names in the group. Disney's Disney actually up. rallying after hours. Yeah. But for, first, uh, uh, John, do we have a Netflix after hours chart I ordered up? Let me see ne this. Uh, Disney's up 3% of the after hours. I mean, this is like a... a First of all, this stock now is back into the the post earnings gap from April. Fucking nailed um, it. It spent the it. it spent the entire summer and fall consolidating at very low levels. So and here's what I asked on the way here in an Uber. I said, "Is Netflix down seventy percent going to be the most obvious buy of all time today?" In in like this market, is that going to be one of those things in a few years? Everyone goes, "Oh, of course." I thought you it was bought Netflix down seventy percent. Listen, I don't want any credit for being in the stock because I went on TV. I was saying wild shit today on CNBC. I was like talking about how I was clenching and doing kegels ahead of the earnings report. Like it's a kegel. I, I know you don't want to know. Um, so I was not confident that there was going to be like this huge beat tonight. I didn't think that at all. I'm happy that it happened. Now I have to reassess. Do I want to stay with it? I think I kind of do. I'm happy uh, but bitter. Like you're I'm happy, happy for, for you. You're, you're happy for me. I yeah. say you You'd wait till the ad tier comes out because I think that's going to be big for it too. Dude, you said something, Michael, that had not occurred to me, but that I actually believe in. You said that like Netflix could be recession proof or recession resistant. resistant. Yeah, no, nobody's canceling their Netflix. Like no matter how bad. Like it gets. like if you don't have a job, you need Netflix more than if you do. Yeah. So they're also kicking ass on content again. Dahmer is blowing up. Um, it's a pop culture phenomenon. Did you watch it yet? No, it's, I don't. I don't like stuff with cruelty. I don't, I don't ever watch shit no, like that. It's very soft. Okay, he's it's, very soft. No, I just don't like. I just don't like it. But um, the Watcher is hot. I don't know what that is. It's a haunted house in New Jersey. Oh, it's uh, what's that guy's name? Bobby. What's his name? Kind of Valley. I'll try. I'll try to watch that. You Listen, it, what? Uh, what? What do I want to do on that? Oh, so I want to get to a couple of things specifically. Netflix beat on both the top and bottom line. The big headline number that moved the stock was 2.41 million net subscribers. The forecast coming directly from Netflix was 1 million. So they're finally getting good at the sandbagging game. Uh, only took them two or three years. They, they actually said they were going to stop predicting their own subs in the fourth quarter of this year. It will be their last um, sub forecast, which I think is wise. Apple stopped making – remember, Apple used to tell you how many phones they thought they would sell. They don't do that anymore either. Why paint yourself into a corner with a metric that's totally out of your control? And the market so, doesn't care. Well, it does. It, care, it focuses too much on that, and that's why they're going to stop doing it. No, I'm saying um, remove, removing that number. Like, yeah, no tough shit. Deal. We're not giving it to you anymore. Uh, they did say, though, that during this fiscal quarter, they think they'll add 4.5 million subs. That's a really good number. Um, for, for a business that's fairly mature. Uh, free cash flow was $472 million compared with minus $106 million this quarter last year. And they said, we continue to expect free cash flow of a billion dollars for the full year 2022, plus or minus a few hundred million. Uh, they actually went out of their way to point out that they are earning, they have positive earnings and all of their competitors combined are losing $10 billion in aggregate. Which was a little bit spicy from Netflix, um, but Who I kind of, I kind of, Alex Morris I liked it. They're, they're dominating just in terms of just financial, financial uh, numbers. They're killing. And uh, I think Netflix is more revenue than all the next three biggest combined, something like that. John, give me the net new Netflix subscribers quarterly. Who did that? Oh, uh, give me Google Trends. No, that's bullshit. I don't believe this. Okay, sure, it's bullshit. 
You don't believe this? Do, are a lot of your friends talking about the rings of power, Michael? Are a lot of the people in your Dungeons and Dragons role-playing group talking about rings of power? No, that's not what's popping this fall. It's Dahmer. Dahmer is what's going on right now. They got to make a sequel now. Um, maybe like... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave here. I'm going to leave you guys with a teaser. Could strong earnings save us from the bear market? Ponder no. that. No. No. I'm st- okay. That's I don't know. Te- do, you th- do you think so? I hope so. Here, what do they never... People never adjust for inflation is earnings. What makes earnings stronger? Higher prices. Earnings are going to be coming way stronger than people think because high inflation and no one inflation adjusts earnings well, this ever. Is, we spoke about this with Belsky. If Q3 earnings don't soften, why can't you get bullish? But they are softening and they actually, the, the, their, the companies are beating lowered numbers. All right, let me give it to you this way. We had uh, Fine, pro- said going differently. In- Here. Said differently. Bye, everyone. What if, thank you, Ben. What if, what if the market rallies on, on uh, less bad than expected? Okay, this is going into today, so Netflix is not in this calculation. 35 companies reported third quarter earnings so far. It's all financials, of the, who cares? Of the 35 that reported, 68.5% beat uh, estimates. Nice. That is slightly higher than the historic average of 66. Um, but third quarter uh, growth rate is about a 3.6%. Like the estimate, if we get through this earnings season unscathed and we have 3.6%, um, growth that's down from 11% last quarter. So the trend is clearly lower, and analysts have taken down numbers for 10 out of 11 sectors for this quarter um, since the end of last quarter. So, yes, they're beating, but they're beating lowered numbers in most respects. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just not sure that that represents a bottom for the stock prices. What are your thoughts? Um. Well, a lower the low. Are you are you watching Dahmer right now? I'm <laughs> looking at I'm looking I'm looking I'm looking. Uh, United <laughs> Airlines is up seven percent in the after hours. What did Johnson and Johnson do today? I didn't see gold. Um, Goldman had a so-so report. The stock rallied. Flat for uh, Johnson. Um, can earnings put in a? Yeah, absolutely. Dude, the Nasdaq fell thirty-five percent. You don't think we can get like? You don't think we could chill out with new lows for a quarter? Uh, for a quarter, yeah. But yeah. then we're in, but then next year we're we're in like official recession territory and it's it's going to be tough to say that we've seen the worst of the earnings revisions downward. That's all I'm saying. I just don't think we have. And earnings don't necessarily bottom with the stock market. I don't I don't think that that it's a, a coincident thing. I know we've done a lot of work on that and we have specifics, but I'm just giving you I'm just giving you my take. I don't I don't think we'll get that. Uh, you know who reported after the bell? I thought this was interesting. Interactive brokers. Up 3% in the after hours. Commission revenue actually increased to $320 million on higher customer futures trading volume. Oh, I was going to guess options. Options uh, too. Yeah. Higher yeah. options, commission per contract. They also said customer accounts increased 31% to $2 million. So they're like adding a lot of customers in the last year. Wait, what was that last number you just said? 31% increase in customer accounts. They added $2 million new accounts. So I thought that was, that's I thought curious. that was interesting. That, that's coming from Sean. I haven't, I haven't triple vetted it, but um, it looks like he cut and pasted from somewhere. Um, net interest income increased seventy three percent to four hundred seventy three million yeah. on higher benchmark interest rates and customer credit balances. So I thought everything. it was, I thought it was, it's not Robin Hood, but it's the same neighborhood. So uh, do we want to do anything on Goldman? They're retrenching again. The, they're scaling back their consumer banking ambitions, and they're merging wealth management with asset management, remerging wealth management with asset management. Any thoughts? I wonder what's going on with Goldman and Marcus and the push into... It's too expensive to acquire customers, something that anyone could have told them three years ago. It's, too, it's, it's not a Actually, great business. what happened with their experiment with Apple? Remember they were doing a credit card with that Apple? That seems to be going well. They're expanding that. They're doing more and more. Now they want to do checking accounts uh, and savings accounts for people that have the Goldman Apple credit card. Have you that ever seems seen, to be a, a bright spot. Have you spot. ever seen one of those in the wild, an Apple credit card? I feel like if you have one of those, that you're, that's like almost like a Silicon Valley thing maybe or like a, a NorCal thing. It's hard for me to imagine like a, a middle-aged woman in Ohio feeling like they need an Apple credit card. No, that's a definitely a, that's a certain demographic. So It's a millennial thing. Goldman uh, – 
Goldman hit the 200 day and closed well off the highs. It's in a downtrend. I don't know. We'll say. What about what doesn't, about JB? Doesn't look great. Uh, so this is a name that I don't follow, but I think it's a relatively important name given the state of the economy right now. Q3 revenue was up 22 percent. Not a surprise. Uh, obviously, the rates for moving things are very high. Year over year, uh, uh, that's a year over year growth number to 3.84 billion. Earnings were up 37 percent. So whatever their higher costs are, they are passing that on wait without minute, much of a, a problem. Wait a minute. You would think between uh, labor and gas that – They're hitting the customer. Revenue growth was driven by a 17% increase in revenue load per, revenue per load in its intermodal segment. Intermodal is the, uh, the crate that they can pull off a train and put on a truck. They don't have to move the, the, the contents around. So Ben made this point on tomorrow's podcast, on tomorrow's Animal Spirits, that we're talking a lot about like labor and uh, wages, wage increases as the sticky part of inflation, like the bad part of it. Yeah. It seems like corporations aren't getting any heat for continuing to raise costs and pass on margin, pass on increases and continuing to expand their margins. Um, there's a guy, Robert Reich, who was like a Clinton era labor secretary, I think, or maybe Obama's labor secretary. He's been tweeting about this stuff where like, uh, all the higher costs in the economy, um, corporate America just had its best earnings year in history. Oh, this guy so like the money's, yeah. yeah, I mean, he's a yeah. communist, but, um, there are people, there are people, it's just not, there's nobody on wall street really, uh, talking about that. All right, let's keep it moving. What do you got for me? Um, all right, I want to talk about – I'm not like a huge seasonality guy, but when I saw this, uh, you got to – you know, this stopped me in my tracks. This was a face blower. Let's let's talk about – we got midterm elections com coming up. This is uh, – I think this is Michael Aroni over at State Street or somebody at State Street did this. Uh, chart on, please. Thank you. All right, so what we're looking at is very simple. Oh, this is interesting. You're looking at the trailing on the left-hand side. The trailing and following 12-month S&P 500 performance going to a midterm election. And this just intuitively makes sense. November through November, the red line, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a grind. There's a lot of volatility. But look what happens in the 12 months following the, ele the election. Look at that blue straight rocket. So this is one of those things where we know this because we've seen too many examples in both directions. A lot of people think that there's going to be like this really strong – tailwind or a headwind depending on which party takes control of which house but it turns nothing out to nothing to do with that the only thing people want is for the goddamn thing to be over resolution resolution that's right so so that's do right. I have the chart one more time please john um so uh the s p 500 has not posted negative returns 12 months following a midterm election since 1950. now this could be the year obviously who knows but it's a pretty good track record 12 for 12. So oh, no, what, is what, the, what is that uh wait hold on it's so 12. The, so the S and P five hundred price return twelve months following the midterms is up an average of sixteen percent, and the S and P has not posted negative returns twelve months after a midterm in seventy two years. I think that's that's 18, the big takeaway. That's eighteen midterm elections, never negative twelve months later. I respect that's really, that. That's really fascinating, and that feeds into the presidential cycle stuff. That uh, who was on the show talking about that? Joe Terranova, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. We had Joe on uh, Compounded Friends, and he laid this out for us really nicely. Uh, all right, so something to look forward to. That's about a month from now. Do you know who you're voting for? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> have you ever voted in a midterm in your life? Mm, I don't know. I don't Maybe. think you have. If, if you had to squint, I don't think you have. All right. Um, I want to do this thing about just where we are, the rally over the last two days notwithstanding. If we were to finish the year where we're trading right now, it would be the worst year in a century um, for – here, for, let, me, let me set this up. I would say congratulations, first of all, to all of you watching this. You've just survived 80 percent, give or take, of the worst year in a century for U.S. investors. I'm not really sure what else you would be worried about after facing down Freddy Krueger unless you think Jason or, or Mike Myers are in the next room. I think if you've been through this and you've been adding to your portfolio all year – you're like in the upper decile of investors, and you're doing pretty well. Um, this comes to us from Frank Holmes from uh, U.S. Global Investors. I met him once. He's a nice guy. Um, with, only, with only a little over 50 trading days left in 2022, 
it looks more and more likely that this will be among the very worst years in history for investing. Since World War II, there have been only three instances, 74, 2002, and 2008, when the S&P 500 ended the year down more than 20%. If 2022 ended today, it would mark only the fourth time. So that in and of itself is, is uh, extraordinary. Um, we have a scatter plot here too. This is Frank. The scatter plot below shows each year's total returns for the S&P 500 on the horizontal axis and U.S. bonds on the vertical axis. As you can see, look at that bottom left quadrant, guys. 2022 falls into the most undesirable quadrant along with the years 1931, 1941, and 1969. Good nice. Very nice. Good years to be buying. Not only have stocks been knocked down, but so have bond prices. I mean, we all knew this, but this visualization is helpful. And what this means is that the traditional 60-40 portfolio composed of 60 stocks, 40 bonds is facing its worst year in 100 years. So, uh, look, I, I would say uh, his takeaway is you have to add real assets like gold and silver. That's not my takeaway. I think the only question now that matters is when will the correlation between stocks and bonds break? I think one of them has to win. What's your take on that? Or what are your thoughts on that? That's what I wanted to ask you tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. So what stops going down first? I think that correlation cannot last longer than it's already already lasted for. I'm sorry, I just can't imagine it. So which which when will the correlation break? I, I'm not even saying which side wins temporarily. Well, do interest rates need to get to where the Fed says their terminal rates are going to be at? What is that, 4.5%? Well, the two-year might need to. The 10-year doesn't. So where's the two-year right now? Four? It's close enough. They're all, everything's at four now. What the, stops? The, the question is, bonds and stocks selling off all year. This has now gone on for 10 straight no, months. I understand. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. We've never seen it before. Never seen it before. I don't have a strong. I don't have a strong opinion. Do you? I think this is, this is very tricky. I think it breaks when the Fed says it's done, but I just can't. I can't. If so, if it breaks though, do bond do bond prices start selling off and stock prices start rising and then stocks win? Wouldn't that be a weird way for a recession to get underway? Dude, everything about the last two years is weird. Do you think it's possible that? the bond market, that interest rates start falling before the Fed pauses. Ben said that he thinks that the market might front run the Fed. Is that possible? It happens every time. Uh, what, what historically happens is you see, you see the 10-year fall by 25 basis points right as the Fed is doing its last hike or something like that. I'll double check that, but it's, who, it's who, something who, to that effect. Who looked at that? That sounds like, Some, uh, sounds somebody, like Nicholas. Somebody did that work and they said, watch – for when the bond price falls as the Fed's doing its last hike. And that'll, that's how you know it's, I, I should say, that's how you will know it's the last hike. When they do it and the market is so unfazed that it's already betting on the, the eventual cut. That might have, I mean, quite frankly, that might have already happened. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the 10-year does in November when we get a 75 basis point rate hike that everyone on earth knows is coming. I, re I really don't know. I don't know what the reaction is in the 10-year. It'll be interesting to see. Um, but I, I, I personally think that's the only question that matters. That correlation is going to break. We don't know why or when or who wins, but it's going to happen. Uh, it looks you're, like te what? You're up. I'm just looking at the tenure. It looks like it's at a high. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, not, it's, still, it's still trucking along. That's right. Okay. Um, next, we are going to. Ah, Okay. We've spent a lot of time talking about this over the past year, that if we do go into a recession, the consumer has never been better prepared for it financially. Now, of course, depending on the duration and, and uh, depth of the recession, that excess savings will get depleted, but it's a fact. It's a fact. So I want to talk about Bank of America's earnings. Uh, the C their CFO said, quote, overall consumers remain resilient and they continue to spend at an elevated pace. They're paying down their loan balances at elevated rates with continued ability to borrow. And before we get to some of those charts. Wait, what? wait, his name, the chief financial officer of Bank of America is Alistair Borthwick. What type of name is that? Is that, is that Welsh? What is that? It's like, a, it's like from a Harry Potter movie. All right, go on. Um, 
So before we get to the some some good healthy charts, uh, this this chart jumped out at me from their earnings report. Chart on, please. So they're still doing this thing where they're comparing today versus 2009. Like I think we're still they're still scarred by that. 2009. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. What what is the significance? Because it was the, the last the GFC. Okay. I just thought this was interesting. I don't know why it's still in here, but they're still uh... anyway. All right. Next chart. Okay, I want to focus on a few things. Number one, let's look at the bottom right. The average consumer deposit balances remain above pre-pandemic levels. So this is Jan this is January 2020. So people that had average balances of under 2K, their average balance is up five times. For people that have uh, between two and five, it's up three times. And for people with between 10 and 20, it's up 2X. But look at the lowest cohort. cohort. Up 5x since pre-pandemic. But that's the answer to the riddle. Why aren't these people working? Why isn't the labor force participation rate improving? This is this is the reason why. And why aren't, are, earnings soften, why aren't earnings soften? Why aren't earnings falling yeah, apart? People are between two and five times better off cash-wise than they were pre-pandemic. It's not a riddle. This is this is the answer. This is it. This is it. I completely agree. That's the answer. And it won't last forever. The problem is, it's taking a while. It's taking a while. <laughs> Chart back on and let's go through them. So, all right, also lower left, this is interesting. Uh, look at the gas. So the transaction yeah. number's up 4%, but it's 23% in terms of dollars. We, obviously, that's not a riddle. We know, it's, we know exactly what's going on there. Yep. Uh, look, at, look at travel and entertainment. People where are doing is, it. Where is that, uh, top, top right? Left. No, bottom left, bottom left, right next to gas. People are oh, doing oh. it. They're going. Yep. Yeah. So I listen, I, I think uh I look I wrote about this, we won't talk about it again, but like we really did get to this moment where everybody was good and they had all the cash they needed and they it it really made it obvious that the the economy doesn't function when everyone is good. And it's such a such a depressing way to think about this, but that's the that's the truth. And we've never known we've never known that definitively and now we do. Last chart, please, John. Credit card days. Okay. Um, late stage, so 90 day, 90 day uh, plus credit card delinquencies remain near multi year lows. Yeah, it's not going up. So I mean, it's, look, it's, look start, at the, look it's at the, starting to, but look at the look at the bottom right. No, it's 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 gone up a little bit, but off, off you know these days these these you see the lines are increasing thirty to fifty nine, but off of historic lows. Yeah. Um, if you by the time you start seeing that spiking, too late. You will. But you will have had so many other warnings elsewhere from the economy. Like, this is not going to be a leading indicator. I, I don't think. It used to be. It used to be a very good coincident indicator. I think because of what we looked at on the last chart, how much, just how much access to money people have, this one's, gonna, this one's not going to be as useful as it used to be. I could be wrong, but um, I, I think there'll be plenty of warning that things are getting really bad before you see people changing their habits to that degree. Uh, all right, let's let's keep going. I want to do this thing on the treasury market. Uh, we had Jan Van Eck on with us a few months ago, and we were talking about when the Fed starts to taper, like the stability of the treasury market, the liquidity. Surely there have to be people all over the world hungry for a three percent uh, treasury bond rate. Uh, on the ten year, and Freezing that was cold. Freezing that was cold. that was one of our more ice cold takes uh, in recent memory. First of all, John, do we have the clip for this uh, when Van Eck schooled us? I don't know if that's coming. All right, I'm not sure. He can interrupt me if if he can interrupt me if 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 he has it. If not, no big deal. Um, there was a piece in Bloomberg: the most powerful buyers in Treasuries are all bailing out at once. So I thought. Uh, I thought this was interesting. It's saying from Japanese pensions and life insurers to foreign governments and U.S. commercial banks, where once they were lining up to get their hands on U.S. government debt, most have now stepped away. And then there's the Federal Reserve, which a few weeks ago upped the pace that it plans to offload treasuries from its balance sheet to $60 billion a month. If one or two of these steadfast sources of demand were bailing, the impact would likely be little cause for alarm. But for every one of them to pull back is an undeniable source of concern. And uh, 
one guy was saying since the year 2000, there has always been a big central big, uh, bank on the margin buying a lot of treasuries. Now we're basically expecting the private sector to step in instead of the public sector. Um, we're asking them to take down all these treasuries that we are going to push back into the system without a glitch and without a massive premium. So there is a, a, a true buyer strike in treasuries, but my, what yeah, I wanted we, to ask can you- stop, Can we just like stop yeah. issuing bonds? Can we just stop borrowing money for a minute? Or That's the whole Ponzi be- ends then. Then we can't fund <laughs> the government anymore. Um, we have two charts from Bookvar. Let's look at these really quickly, and then I'm going to ask you how my dare question. You, how dare you call this country a Ponzi? I resent that. What the, this, uh, this first chart is U.S. commercial bank holdings of treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities. Okay. So you can see where this is going, right? What, I, what this peaked when the market peaked? <laughs> yeah, dude. This okay. peaked when QE peaked. Um, all right. The next one is U.S. treasuries held in custody for foreign accounts. Uh, the international community is yeah, running this. from treasuries. No, China, China's been selling all decade. And uh, everyone is now selling because everybody needs capital. I was going to say, they're selling because they need because they need to sell. Uh, yeah, no, of course. They're not selling to – they're not bond veg- vigilantes. Like They're not like, we'll show you. They're selling because the higher dollar is, is killing them and they need access to dollars. So we know about that too. Um, so my question, my question is, will a recession – with rates having peaked uh, already, let's say we're clo- I think we're close, bring enough retail or hedge fund or asset management money into the treasury market to calm things down. Because the Fed is not going to stop reducing its balance sheet even once we're in recession, at least if you listen to them. I know we're trying to like entertain and give opinions, but this is like an if this, then if that, then this. Like I, I know. <laughs> I don't. I don't even really have an opinion because it's. Who is buying all these? Who is buying all these bonds? I think we've reached a point where people will, but I would have thought that at three percent. All right. So at four so percent, I mean. Hang on, hang on, I got something for you. So Eric Baltrun has tweeted. Treasury ETFs have now taken in one hundred billion, one hundred eleven billion dollars year to date, which is double the old annual record, which is pretty interesting. And I wonder if this is people selling. They're bond mutual funds at a loss and just rotating into treasuries. Or money market funds. What do you mean? Couldn't this just be coming? I mean, I did this. I had Fidelity. I had Fcash, which is Fidelity's default money market fund. I pulled every dollar out of it and bought BIL. Every dollar I knew I wasn't using anytime in the next couple of weeks. BIL is an ETF. That's the three-month treasury. It's 4%. Why would I sit in Fcash? earning 1.1%. So I think a big funding source for treasury bond ETFs is going to be money markets. I can't be the only person thinking that way. So maybe that's the, maybe that's the answer. We're showing bank deposits and, and, and money sitting in bank accounts. You know they're under-earning what they should be earning because that's the business model. Like whatever, whatever's on deposit at Bank of America, I wouldn't suggest all of it's going to go into treasuries, but... I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of I feel it like did. There's, there's so much inertia there. Actually, if you look at the money sitting in checking accounts at banks, you will see exactly what I'm talking about. It's record highs. People don't move their cash. You did. Um, I don't think that there is a great realization on the part of most Americans what they could actually be earning on that kind of cash right now. Yeah. You agree with that? Uh, like I, no one's advertising this. Well, you see CDs are coming are back in vogue. CDs. But I think the, av- the average person, you might be right. You might be right. All right, let's do we work. Um, okay, uh, I don't know why I was looking at this, but I just want to rewind the clock a little bit. I know we work. It's like enough with we work. It was like the entire 2019 was was we work, and then we got the book and the movie. But I just want to revisit this. So um, I was looking at their S one, and it literally starts. It like actually starts. As it says our story. This is how it starts, and it's like it's a it's a giant S one. It's 100 plus pages of thing. We are a, quote, we are a community company committed to maximum global impact. Our mission is to elevate the world's consciousness. I know we know that, but they actually said that. Yeah. How's it going? How's that going? Is the world's consciousness elevated yet? So is let's, there more let's, to go? It feels wanna, pretty good right now. I want to look at a few charts that they included. They looked at, a, they looked at this as a $3 trillion opportunity. <laughs> For um, God's sake. The total addressable market. This is like the height of nonsensical nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they called themselves. They said that they, they, had, they had. Wait, stop. Like, Target 280. Ci- Are there 280 cities in the world that even have office buildings? I can't, I, I can't picture stop. it. Um, 
chart off for a second. I think the WeWork next door to us might have closed. Uh, it's possible. I walk past there, but I don't look up. Wait, put that chart back on really quickly. Two hundred fifty-five million is the addressable amount of people that would work in a WeWork. How much weed were they smoking? I'm gonna take the under. All, all of the weed. Here's a quote: We pioneered a, and a, they use quotes. So I'm gonna do it. We pioneered a space as a service membership. Sass, ass, super sexy. Space as a service. Ship. All right. So the deal is this, Josh. The last time that let's look at the cumulative funding raise, John, please. The last, the last. Thank you. The last uh, valuation that they got from Massa was at a. So they raised twenty one billion. That he was at a. Care. That was at a forty seven billion dollar valuation. I don't know how much uh, Newman sold along the way, but I do know that his current estimated net worth is about the current market cap of WeWork. So when he left, he got a $445 million payout. It was $245 million in company stock, which is now basically worthless. But he had $200 million in cash. So when they were going to IPO, what were they trying to come out at? Was it 90? I can't remember. 50? 40. No, no, 40. No, no, no. no, no. Moss's 38 last, billion. No. SoftBank's last investment was at a $47 billion valuation. What was the IPO going to be? I'm telling you the answer. They were they were putting this out at like a $38 billion valuation, and it got pulled a week before. It had to be more than that. I'm t no? Whatever. Uh, no, no, no. Wait, stop. So the valuation is different from what price the stock opens at. If they were— I'm if, saying that Masayoshi's son last investment— was at a $47 billion valuation. If you're telling me that the street was going to take it as an IPO at 40, fine, whatever, it doesn't matter. Maybe you're right. But uh, I think if you're selling that to, if you're selling that to a wealth management client and that's where a lot of this stock was going to go, you weren't saying it's worth 40. You were probably saying, I think it'll go to 70. Like that's, that's how you play stock like this. Okay, so this, this came obscene. public, this came public via SPAC, no? Um, eventually it came public via SPAC. It's got a new CEO. He seems like a respected, serious guy. Chart but it's on. in the worst possible. Yeah, I mean, what, what do you think is going to happen with this? It's it's they they're not profitable yet, and nobody wants to look at any company that's not profitable. So it doesn't matter how well he's doing at getting quote getting expenses under control. That this is a, a going concern risk until he can somehow show a profit. So real quick, John, happening. let's let's show the revenue and then the uh, the EBITDA. All right, so the revenue is growing. Yeah, no, he's he's not. I'm telling you, he's he's not a bad guy running this thing. I just think like it's impossible. Next chart, basically, to turn this thing around in an environment like this. But but it kind of looks like they are. I mean, they're still losing money, which is really bad. But the losses are are. Shrinking. You showed me the market cap. Is the stock price three dollars? Uh, let's what? see. The symbols of we, what? I believe, right? Yeah, we work. It's two dollars thirty eight cents. You know what? It's like Reverse an option. It's a, it's like a call option with no maturity. Why would if you're gonna if you're gonna buy a penny stock just for fun? This would be a fun one to buy. I I don't think. Listen, I think that I think the problem you're gonna have now with with office buildings and and commercial real estate in general they can't give it is, away. Right. Everything's gonna be a deal now. Yeah. Everything's gonna everything's gonna be wheeling and dealing, and that hurts WeWork because they're gonna be out there. Like trying to do the same thing as all the building owners are going to do, and the building uh, owners are, are wise to the game. So let's finish up. I got to go to the to the aeropuerto. All right, we're going to. All right, we'll keep the rest of this tight. Uh, we're doing make the case. I would like to pitch you an energy stock that I own. And before I do, for the viewers, we don't give advice on YouTube, so nothing I say right now should drive you to go place a trade in your account. Please. Uh, for compliance purposes, very important that I get that across. Um, I own the stock lower. I'm sticking with it. This is LNG. This is Chenier Energy. Uh, Carl Icahn basically was the primary investor in this in its early life, and I think he's since taken profits and moved on. But I think he got out early, and this is going to be the winter of liquid natural gas. It is literally going to be a life-saving commodity um, this winter. So the war in Russia is obviously the, the, the catalyst here, but also natural gas supplies in Asia are very constricted. China announced over the weekend they're not allowing any export of LNG whatsoever. And I think everyone's going to be fighting for this particular commodity. Chenier is one of the only companies in the world that can supply it at scale. There are 
65 million LNG boats and barges sitting off the coast of, uh, on the Atlantic Ocean, off the coast of Spain. Spain can't intake the stuff fast enough. Like LNG has done a remarkable job. They've spent $30 billion building the facilities here over the last 10 years. And now they have the ability to really supply other continents with natural gas. It's remarkable and it's an emergency situation. So I think they're in a position where they could basically name their price this winter. And uh, I think supplies are going to be short. And I'm praying from a humanitarian perspective that they don't get an ice cold winter. But I think LNG, the company, will benefit almost regardless of what happens, short of Putin surrendering, which I don't think is uh, in the cards. So that's that's my quick pitch on LNG. So what are your the thoughts? St- the stock looks terrific. It's up uh, 65% year to date. Uh, new, it's uh, within within a few sticks of a new high, which is very rare these days. And I'm looking at revenue and free cash flow, which uh, put, put up total return. Put, John, put up this next chart. I mean, this has right, been this has been a this. monster. Yeah, yeah, monster. Um, this, the 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 business is performing at an insane pace. So the the quarterly revenue was in like the two billion dollar neighborhood between 2018 and 2021 and it just printed 8 billion it's so exploded a, f- a 4x yeah. free cash flow is commensurate with the, with the increase um so the stock looks amazing St- i guess yeah probably stick with it don't get stuck i think it's like going over Netflix. i think it's going over 200 this winter and i think it's one of the few stocks that'll be resilient if the ukraine headlines get worse um and the saber rattling gets worse i think this is one of the names that holds up it's just important to understand like this is not a situation like where it's it's Snapchat and Facebook could just come out with their own version of Snaps. You cannot replicate what they have. They have a major competitor called Freeport, which had a huge fire, and their terminals are out of commission, and it's basically LNG's game right now, and that All is right. very rare in the stock market. Let's go. next. Tra- so my mystery chart is I made this very easy for you. Um, it's a dramatic decline. Uh and Ooh, uh so this is i guess i'd be curious to hear the take is this is this like a semiconductor it's apple. story no it's no, nvidia no, no, no. yeah it's nvidia is okay. this a, is it a sem- so look at that market cap decline almost 800 billion to three under 300 is this is this the gaming slowdown is it the semi it's stuff? everything is it, is it For, crypto it's it's, it's just everything, everything. Yeah. it's everything it's u.s regulations on sending advanced technology to china it's um Gaming console hangover after everybody already bought their consoles during the pandemic. It's PC market hangover. It's, it's crypto, cri- it's crypto yeah, it's bust. It's, it's it's literally you couldn't be in a, in a tougher situation in the yeah. short term yeah. than what Nvidia is in. And yeah. I own this. I own the stock. Thank God I own it for years, and I didn't buy it recently. Um, but man, I wish I had sold calls or something uh, at some point earlier this year. I don't know if it gets better. I would not be like racing in to buy it here. I don't care how much it's down. It's um, just in a very tough place. All right, listen. Sorry for taking two weeks off. We'll, we'll, we'll back. We're back next week. Why do the lights slowly go down where you're sitting? Is it because the you were using natural sunlight? You're the in Boston? sun is setting. Yes. All right, we're going to let you get out and do what you got to do. Guys, thank you so much for watching. All new Animal Spirits first thing tomorrow morning. You do not want to miss this episode. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Listen to the koala. Click that button, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Very easy way to do it. Tell your friends about the channel, and we will see you next time.